Hi, welcome to the first session of our baptism classes. Um, and this exciting thing that you're thinking about being baptized, that that's something that God's put on your heart. And so what we want to do with these classes, we just want to make sure that you know and understand um, what, what you're doing and what baptism signifies and why it's so important. And so we're just going to dive right in and kind of talk about a little bit more about what we'll, we'll be talking about in the next few sessions. Um, and to start off, we just want to look at a verse in Acts. It's in Acts 2.37. And to set up the, the situation in this verse in Acts 2.37 is you have, um, so we, we as Christians, we believe that, that Jesus died and that he rose again. And then that he spent 40 days teaching his apostles, his disciples, um, what they're supposed to do next. And then after 40 days, he rose into heaven and gave them instructions. And one of the instructions that he gave them before he rose, uh, ascended into heaven is he said, wait here in Jerusalem, don't go anywhere, and you're going to wait um, for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, and he'll come upon you with great power. And so they're hanging out. And then 40 days later was this Jewish festival called Pentecost. And so they're sitting at Pentecost, they're eating, they're worshiping, and all of a sudden, bam, the Holy Spirit comes down, and it says that it was like flames of fire above the apostles' heads, and the apostles stand up and they start speaking, and you have Jews, uh, because of this festival, you have Jews from all over the world that are there, they they're all speak different languages, but the apostles stand up and they start talking, and all the, the people understand um, what the apostles are saying, even though they don't speak the same language. And uh, and then Peter, kind of the lead apostle or lead disciple, he stands up and he gives this speech and, and he talks about who Jesus is and, and what Jesus did and what uh, the, they need to do in response. And so uh, Acts 2.37 is kind of picking up at the end of Peter's speech. And it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we supposed to do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they respond to Peter's message, and Peter tells them to do three things. He says, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's kind of how our, our lessons are going to be structured here. We're going to talk about what it means to repent, um, why we are baptized, and um, what it means to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, so today, we're going to focus on this idea of repentance. What does it mean to repent? And so the word in Greek it literally means to change your mind, and not like change your mind like, well, I want tacos instead of spaghetti. Even though I want spaghetti earlier, I want tacos tonight. It means to, to change your mind in such a way that like everything that you think, everything that you do is altered. Um, so an example from my own life is when I first met my wife, Anne, I was not interested in her, not attracted to her, like... Yeah, just she didn't do anything for me. And then over uh, uh, after about a year, I, I really started to get to know her better. And, and all of a sudden, um, I realized I was very attracted to her in, in many different ways, physically, emotionally, mentally. And, you know, I've grown to love her. And so what you could say is that, that my mind has been changed. I have repented from that old way of, of not being interested in this amazing woman. And I've repented into this new life. I've repented into this new way of thinking. And this, I've changed my mind so much about Anne that has affected everything I do with my life. Um, I live my life completely differently now because I've repented of uh, my mind towards her. And so the Bible tells us that we are supposed to repent, and, and we repent of our sins. And so the idea is the same, that we change our minds so completely about sin that it affects everything that we do and the way that we live our lives. And so to understand what that means, we need to first look at, well, what is our mindset of sin, and what is sin in general? And so to look at what sin is in general, the first place we're going to turn is we're going to look at Romans 1.18. So if you want to look up Romans 1.18, and I just need to pull it up here on my screen, it says, um, and we want to, what we're looking at this verse is we're looking, what does this verse say that sin is? And so Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I'm going to read that one more time because it's a little bit wordy. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. 
And so the reason that we're reading this verse is like, I think oftentimes we think of sin and we think, well, sin is just the bad things I do. It's when I lie, it's when I hurt someone, it's when I cheat, um, you know, it, it's when I smoke or drink or whatever. We think of those, the bad things that we do as sin. And, and in one sense, that's true. But what this verse points out is that sin is a lot more than that. It says here that, that the wrath of God is revealed against sin and that that sin suppresses the truth of God. So if you think of something that's suppressed, it's, it's held back. It, it can't get out, even if it wants to. You know, if you suppress a, a revolution or, or suppress these things, whatever you suppress, it can't get out. And so what this verse says is that we suppress the truth of God. We don't let the truth out. Our sin suppresses the truth of God. And what I think that, that I understand that to mean is that, that God designed this world to operate and go a certain way. And when it goes how it's, op, it's supposed to operate, it all is good. And it, it's beautiful. And we see love. And we see people building one another up. And we see um, just things working the way they're supposed to. And ultimately, because it's so good and so wonderful and so beautiful, it ultimately glorifies our creator. It glorifies God. It glorifies his truth, the truth of his creation. But when we sin, um, we, we make that creation not function the way it's supposed to. Um, we don't act in love. We don't act in kindness and goodness to people. And so what we do is we suppress the truth of God. God's glory and the wonderful God that he is doesn't shine through because our sin suppresses that it hides it. And if you think about, um, you know, when people talk, um, one of the most common reasons that people have for not believing in God is they say, well, there's so much evil in the world. Well, what is that? That's, that's the truth of God being suppressed by sin. People's sin um, leads people to the conclusion there can't be a God. There, this can't, there can't be the truth of a good God because there's so much evil in the world. People's sin suppress it. But, but not just other people's sin. Your sin and my sin suppress the truth we believe. Um, the things that we do have, have, hurt pe have hurt God's reputation, have hurt people's view of God. Um, when, when we lie to people, when, we, when, we, um, when we, we hurt other people, they think, well, how can there be a God? Because this person's wronged me so, so awfully. So, so that's the first thing we want to get down is that, that our sin is not ultimately against other people, but it's ultimately against God. And so when we're repenting of sin, we're repenting of our rebellion against God and against his truth. And the second point kind of came up from the first one, and it, we get this from Romans 3.23, so if you just want to flip over a couple pages um, from where you're at, Romans 3.23, and it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so according to this verse, who has sinned? We all have sinned. You've sinned, I've sinned. Um, yeah, and I think that this, you know, I, hopefully you haven't got to the point of wanting to be baptized without realizing this truth in the world, that everybody's sinned, that everybody has rebelled against God, that everybody's tried to suppress God's truth, that everybody said, I want to do things my way, God, not your way. Hopefully you haven't got to this point and think that. And um, what I think the important thing to realize here too is, is that um, because we've all sinned against an infinite God, we're infinitely guilty of our sin. It's not like, well, you've sinned a little bit less than I have, so you're a little bit better of a person. No, no we've sinned against an infinite God, and we've all suppressed his truth. We've all made it so his glory is not going out, and so our sin is all equal in weight before him. This doesn't mean that, you know, it's not worse to murder somebody or, or rape somebody than to, you know, steal a pack of gum, but it means that all of those things suppress God's truth in the world, and that we all have done it. And so then the last thing we want to look at sin is why? Why do we all sin? Um, and so one more verse from Romans, just flip over another page or so, and it's Romans 5.12. In Romans 5.12, it says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So once again, this is a hard verse. I'm going to read it one more time. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. And this verse is another tricky one to understand. Um, but what it basically says is that Adam, the first man, sinned. 
And so that sin entered humanity. And because of Adam's sin, death entered humanity. And then there's a little bit of debate among theologians about uh, what came next, whether because of death entering that that led to sin to enter all of humanity or whether sin entered all humanity and so death entered. But they agree, uh, Christian theologians uh, agree that um, all people sin, that, 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 that not just that we all sin, but we all have what's called a sin nature that makes us sin. And you can, you can think about babies, right? It doesn't take, you don't have to spend much time around a baby or a little young child to know that people are sinful. Um, that that they, we have this sin nature, and the sin nature is what causes us to sin. Um, if you th- and this is a little get, bit contrary to you know a lot of people out in the world today. They think, well, you know, I kind of think that people are genuine, are, are generally good. They, they make some mistakes, but people are generally good. But but this this whole idea of a sin nature goes against that. No, people are born in a state where they will choose to rebel against God, where they'll choose themselves over God's goodness, God's creation, God's truth. They'll choose themselves over that. And, and you know, unless if you doubt that, or if you meet someone who doubts that, ask them this question. If you have two kids, and you have one kid, and you raise them, and you teach them good from evil, and then you have another kid, and you say, I'm just going to let them go on their own, well, which kid is going to turn out better in life? That's not even a hard question, right? We all know that the first kid, the one that you teach good and evil to, that they are going to turn out much better. And, and that in itself is a proof of a sin nature. Why? Because if you just leave a kid to its own, his own devices, if you just leave a person, a human to their own devices, their sin nature is going to cause them to be selfish, that to, to go after their own selfish desires and to suppress God's truth. We have to learn how not to be sinful. And so uh, we see in evidence in creation that, that we do have a sin nature. So when we're talking about repenting from sin, we're talking about turning from your sin and changing your mind in such a way, we are talking um, not just about, well, I'm going to stop doing the bad things I do, but I'm going to change the way I think, that instead of thinking in terms of, of doing what I want to do, um, and my desires, I want to think in terms of what God wants for me and what God's desires are. I don't want to suppress his truth anymore. Um, I don't want to, to just follow the crowd. I just want to do what everybody else is doing. I want, I want God's desires to be shaping my life. I want, I want to be a part of, of glorifying his truth and not suppressing his truth. And that is what it means to repent. We change our mind towards sin in such a way that, that we want to be a part of what God's doing and a part of glorifying him and not a part of suppressing him. Um, so uh, how do we get to that place of repentance? And, and we have to be careful here because there's something that, that looks a lot like repentance that isn't quite repentance. So we're going to flip ahead um, in our Bibles just one or two more books to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So in 2 Corinthians 7.10, we read um, by Paul, he wrote, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And so Paul talks about two different kinds of grief here. And we, you know, we know grief is sadness or sorrow. And he talks about two different types of grief here. He talks about um, godly grief and worldly grief. And he says godly grief is what produces repentance. And so what I understand from this passage is, is we've all been sorry for our actions before, sorry for our sins, sorry for our wrong before, but we're not always sorry for the same reasons. I've been sorry before, not really sorry. Um, I, I get sorry, you know, we might get sorry that we get caught or I'm, I'm sorry that I hurt someone else. I didn't really mean to do that or sorry things didn't go the way that I've planned or just sorry that something bad happened. And we're, so, we're truly sorry about those things, um, but we're not repentant about our sin. And to be repentant about our sin, we have to really realize the gravity of our sin, the power of what we've done, the power in the fact that we've chosen ourselves and suppressed God's truth and haven't, haven't been glorifying God. And, and once we get that, then, 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 um, once we, then we have godly grief. We realize that we, we, we didn't just sin against somebody else. We didn't just get hurt someone else. We just didn't, things didn't just go the way that we expected them to or get out of our control. We really sinned against God's plan and purpose. We, we damaged his creation. We damaged his reputation. We damaged his goodness that's supposed to shine through in creation. It's supposed to shine through in what we've done, what we did, what we do. 
I'll try every form of that word. Uh, we, we, we've damaged his reputation in, in all that we do. do. And so um, that, that godly grief over what we've done, that realization is what really produces repentance in our minds. And so when we look at, um, are we just, when we ask this question, are we, do we have godly grief or, or worldly grief? Are we just sorry for what we did? Or are we sorry and, and just um, disdainful of the idea that we, we sinned against God? There's a story in the Bible about King David. You may know it. And, and um, he was king over Israel. And one day he goes out and he's walking around his roof. And he looks over this other roof. And there's this beautiful woman bathing. And he's like, well, eh, that's something I'd like to get with. And so he, he has her come over. And um, they, they, they have sex. And she gets pregnant. And then to cover up his sin, he tries to invite her husband back home. His husband's serving in the army. Um, and he invites her husband back home and, and tries to trick them into sleeping together so that the husband will think it's his baby. But the husband doesn't uh, go along with his, his plan. And then um, ultimately to cover up his sin, he has the husband murdered. And so we see this just levels of sin. First he's, first he's lusting after a woman. Then he's bringing her into his bed and, uh, and, and committing adultery. And then um, he's, he's lying to someone. And then he's murdering someone. And so you see this progression of sin. And then one, this prophet, his friend Nathan, comes to him and, and, and shows uh, uh, David that he's sinned. And then David's response is, I've sinned. And when he comes to it, I've sinned against the Lord. Well, when you think about it, he sinned against Bathsheba, the woman. He sinned against Uriah, her husband. He sinned against his kingdom. He sinned against all these people. But his response is, I've sinned against the Lord. I've grieved God. I've ruined his creation. This wasn't his plan. This wasn't. This isn't the way that he's glorified. When people, um, when people take advantage of women, and when people um, have people murdered, like this isn't glorifying to God. I'm not. I'm not showing who God is in my actions. And so he's grieved. I've sinned against the Lord. And that's the kind of grief that we have. That's what leads to repentance. That's what makes us want to change our minds, change our whole lives, change everything about what we're doing so that, so that we're living a life that glorifies God. All right, we have one last verse to look at about why is repentance so important. I mean, I think it should come through on all we've said, but if it doesn't, um, let's look at Acts 3.19. Um, yeah. I guess, sorry, I skipped one little quick point. Um, so keep flipping to Acts, though. Acts 11, 18. Um, Acts 11, 18 just says one quick little thing about repentance that's really important. It says, um, uh, then to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. We're not going to talk about this whole story and everything, but what's important here is it says that God granted repentance. So repentance isn't just something, well, we just... I just got to make myself sorry to God. It's, uh, it's, it's comes from God. It's this realization of what we've done that God gives us grace to realize the, the, what we've done against him. Um, and that's important to remember that it's not something we just try hard to produce. Like, oh, I just need to make myself repentant. It's like, no, God will grant it to you. All right, um, keep flipping back in Acts. This was the last verse, Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19. Um, and this is another speech by Peter. And, uh, and, he, and he's, the people respond and he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And so what we get from this verse, I'm just going to read it one more time. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. He says that in order for your sins to be blotted out, you must repent. There is no salvation apart from us repenting. We must have that repentance. We must recognize what our sin is. And we must not just recognize it, but we must turn from that sin nature, from our desires, our natural inclinations. We must turn to them and say, God, I don't want what I want anymore, but I want what you want. We have to repent in that way. And our whole mind, our thoughts, our attitudes, the, our actions all have to be changed in order to have salvation, not that we earn salvation, but that, that that demonstrates true repentance, that we've truly changed our thinking and changed our actions about our sin. Let's pray. God, I just thank you that you're a good God, that you grant repentance to us. God, that you can make us aware of the gravity of our sin. God, I'm so sorry for all the times that I just, I revel in my sin, that I'm excited about my sin. 
God, just help me um, to, to repent more and more each day, just to know more and more each day that, that I've turned from that old person. God, I thank you that, that you grant that in my mind and help me to live that out in my actions and in my thoughts and my attitudes, God. I pray also for, for the people watching this video that you'll help them to have truly repented with their lives, to truly turn from their sin and to have a life that's oriented towards glorifying you and all that they do. In your name, amen. Um, so, uh, that's, that's it for this session. What I'd like you to do is I'd like to think about, uh, I have a couple questions here and I'd like you to think about them and, and talk about them with someone else and, and email me, um, with maybe, uh, some question and with a question or comment, um, that you have from this video. So my questions are, is have you experienced repentance from your sin? And if so, how do you know? Thanks for tuning in. I look forward to hearing from you.